In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with author Tom Rosenstiel about his new political thriller, The Days to Come. Tom has switched hats from journalist to fiction writer, possessing a depth of insight into how both disciplines interact with the public and our experience of reality. The Days to Come is a thriller with a climate change theme that touches on many of the complexing factors that can either accelerate or undermine our progress in tackling the climate crisis. In this interview, we discuss how the book intersects with contemporary reality and how fiction and journalism contribute to shaping the narrative we internalise that helps us envision the future. In the next episode, I'm speaking with Indigenous Sami scholar Dr. Tero Mustan who is based in the Finnish Arctic, about the climate changes that threaten his community's existence, and by extension, our own. We will also discuss what we can do to try and reverse the extreme nature of change in these critical and vulnerable regions of the world. Thank you for listening. Please do subscribe, comment, or send feedback, because I do read as much as I can, and try to respond where possible. Thank you. So Tom, it's really good to speak to you. Today, it feels like truth is often stranger than fiction. And in your new book, The Days to Come, you weave in a number of contemporary themes, such as politics, geopolitics, espionage, technology, climate change, conspiracy theories, etc. And um, given your academic work in analyzing journalism, how would you describe your use of real world events for source material? You know, I, I'm trying to write political thrillers that are contemporary and plausible. Um, I think that's somewhat unusual in the United States. Uh, the political thrillers we have tend to be hired assassins working for secret agencies and uh, major buildings in Washington blowing up. I think of these books as actually more like European political thrillers or European crime novels. People like um, Ian Rankin or um, Henny Minkel uh, in Sweden whose books were very plausible and dealt with social issues through crime. You know, when uh, something goes wrong, when there is a crime, a murder, or a conspiracy of some sort, you're upsetting the social order uh, and, um, or something is out of order with the social order. So I think these kinds of books are a good way of getting at issues. To get to your question, I, I usually imagine a situation and then research what would be plausible with that situation. So in the days to come, I imagine a new president uh, taking over the White House who comes from Silicon Valley and is a, a billionaire entrepreneur who thinks of the government in the United States as a broken industry. And he approaches it uh, the way he would a, a disrupted industry using change management techniques and wants to figure out what is one thing that I could do that would make more of a difference on climate than any other. So he assembles experts to try and uh, uh, come up with a dramatic intervention. And the intervention that I came up with is a plausible one. It's based on science. I did a lot of research. The way you would approach government as a broken industry is based on a lot of research. I've done, I did a lot of research and have done a lot of work in my time on change management and entrepreneurial theory. So all of that is real. And you just sort of insert characters who are more dramatic <laughs> than the ones who we have in office. And they, and they can propel the story by going further than, or, or trying to figure out a way to go further than uh, the real world would go. Okay. And is there any, any attempt to use these characters or the themes as sort of vehicles for your own ideas, or maybe, you know, that sort of intersection where fiction and truth or reality seem to be? Well, I think that always happens with, uh, when you're writing fiction, um, my friends who are other uh, writers uh, and I often uh, agree that you, there is a part of you in every little, in every character, even the evil characters for them or the bad characters, for them to seem real, um, you need to empathize, empathize with them. You need to be in their hearts. So to some degree, even the characters with whom I disagree, I'm imagining what is logical for them? You know, one of the things I learned as a journalist very early on is beware of the fallacy of evil people. That people don't are not snidely whiplash. They don't think, ha, 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 how can I do something dastardly today? 
uh, they, there's a logic in their mind to, wa to what they're doing. Um, so the nihilists in Washington who actually don't want to do anything have a reason, a rationalization for why stopping everything or doing nothing makes sense to them. So that also means that you have to be true to each of your characters. So you can't just have them be mouthpiece, mouthpieces for your theories of the world because uh, they would seem like cardboard. They would seem like they weren't real people. They, were seem, they would seem like mouthpieces, like microphones. Um, so one way of dealing with that is, you know, I'm not really sure what the answers are. So I have different characters. I have a president who's very bold and daring and a vice president who he takes a lot of uh, wisdom from who's very uptight and cautious and a rule follower. And then, you know, I have the protagonist in all four of the books in this series are political consultants, political advisors who are brought in when things go bad uh, and they are good at getting to the bottom of things and solving problems. And one of them is a, is a moderate Republican, former military character, um, Peter Reyna. And one of them is a very progressive brassy, very political lawyer who's a Democrat. And their interplay also allows me to kind of play with my two instincts, one of which is maybe we should be super aggressive about everything and, 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 and progressives are right. And, and the other is, no, that's not going to work. It won't work politically. It's unwise. There are all kinds of unintended consequences. So all of these characters, in a, in a way, are reflecting the debate, I think, that goes on in my own mind. Politics in the United States, like in a lot of countries, is so dysfunctional right now, it's not clear what the answer is. And you can't actually point to any characters and say, well, I'm going to have a Roosevelt-like character and that person's going to really solve things, or I'm going to have a Theodore Roosevelt or a you know, or an Obama-like character or a Merkel-like character, because the, no one like that exists in the United States. So you've got to invent someone who is almost a strange agent, a new chemical compound uh, who, who could make changing the dynamics of politics plausible. Okay. And you mentioned upsetting the, the order of uh, things and plausible storylines. And you also mentioned Peter Reiner, the protagonist. One thing as a subplot, well, not subplot, more like a sub theme, was his um, sort of pursuit of truth, if you like. And um, that's quite overtly mentioned in the book. Is, were you making a comment with, with that? And does that link to your sort of background in journalism, his, his own quest for truth? Yeah. Um, you know, Peter Reyna is a, uh, uh, was kind of a rising star in the military who, um, and was an immigrant. He was, a, he was from Italy, he was born in Italy. He was brought to the United States when he was a baby, and he really believed in the, the narrative about the United States uh, being a great place of opportunity. Um, and he went to West Point, um, and he believes that the way you make the country better is by celebrating what's good about it. His partner who's a liberal. He realizes, uh, thinks the way you make the country better or a country better is by criticizing what's wrong. And they just come at this in a very, very different way. But they both became political fixers by uh, believing that facts are sticky things and you can't talk your way out of these things. So that the reason that they've become very valuable and an in demand in Washington is, is because they uh, don't believe that perception in politics is reality and that you can paper over things. They actually think the way you deal with problems is to find out what really happened and then apologize. And that unusual <laughs> philosophy <laughs> that facts matter has uh, made them very, has made them successful and rich a as much as it may, may be, uh, it may seem unlikely. And these characters, they are both amalgams of different political consultants that I have known as a reporter, because ironically, Although political consultants are often viewed as the most cynical, jaded, you know, amoral uh, folks in the political system, I've found that actually they are often the people, because they're hired guns, who will tell a senator or a governor or a president what's really true. The rest of the people who work for these powerful people, their careers are dependent on those people. 
they are staff. They are, you know, it, there's a limit to how far they will go. They rise and fall with the fortunes of their, of their chief. And, um, and it's the hired guns who come, will come in and say, Senator, you're not going to make it. You're, you've got to resign. And I'll help you with the press conference so you can have a life after this. But you're dead. Your, your career in politics is over. Um, and, and so they're, they are ironic truth tellers. And Peter becomes the focus of a cyber attack one that is based on something that in, in its character is very similar to some that have happened to people in the United States um, and how it happens and the, the techniques that are used to uh, create this cyber attack on him personally are all ground in fact. And it just shakes his whole worldview. The idea that people would believe these things sends him into a deep depression because he is such a Boy Scout, literally, he's an Eagle Scout, and he just can't actually believe that that facts don't matter and that people will believe anything. And the sort of QAnon notion that there's a cabal of child molesters running the government, that sort of thing, it, it's so alien to everything he thinks. And I think that, you know, he in that regard, he reflects a lot of people who are who think, well, how could how could this be? How could these conspiracy theories have become not only so widespread, but so influential in in one of our political parties. Do you think that coming back to this idea of plausibility right now in the world we live in, this is entirely plausible. There is fake news, conspiracy theories, alternative facts. These have all been weaponized and they attack us, our perceptions, emotions, etc. If you step back, do you think that there is an antidote to that in the real world, aside from fiction? <sighs> Um, yeah, that's a very, that's it. This has turned into a heavy podcast. Um, you know, I think that all of, all of that is designed to create uncertainty. The purpose of fake news is not to actually make people believe what's fake. It's to cause them to doubt the other side. Um, and then you, then you lend your support to a strong man, to an autocrat. I, I don't know what's true, but I trust him. You can't trust the media. Um, this fact could be wrong. Maybe this vaccine is a fake. Maybe the pandemic is a fake, but I trust uh, uh, this man and he'll sort it out or she'll sort it out. Um, although strong men are usually men, as it, as it seems. You know, autocrats tend to be men. Is there a way out of that? It's very, one of the, one of the preconditions that makes that more plausible is we have a fragmented media system where you, there's no media source that is a public square where everyone gathers around a common set of facts. But there are things uh, that are accentuating this that, you know, that will change. One is the platforms and the way they structure what they consider meaningful engagement can, can be changed. It could even be regulated. And you know, right now we have an economic system online that is built around what makes us different from each other. The way that Facebook and Google and Twitter make money is by, by targeted advertising so that you see ads that are different than I see. And that architecture, when it's flipped in political terms, is perfect for separating people, dividing them politically. Um, it wasn't intended that way. That's not what Facebook had in mind, but it is the effect. It's an architecture of separation that could be changed. The other thing that is, you know, part of this is um, economic uncertainty drives it. People are fearful, and then you can feed their fears. And fake news does that. And this is going to take a while. And I suspect it will take the failure of autocratic regimes. People will try these things, and they will fail. And then they'll go back to, let's try something a little more democratic. Sure. Sure. And um, another another theme which I wanted to bring up is leadership, because leadership is a core component of the book, really. And yeah. you know, coming from COP26 and coming in and looking at what's happening in the US and in Europe and the UK and so on, leadership really does matter. It's been a recurrent theme in this in this podcast, especially now. And I was wondering, it feels like leadership has been abused. We've become very cynical as people. Do you think restoring that trust is something we can achieve? Do you think it's likely? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I think the pandemic was a tremendous opportunity for leaders to do that. 
this is a hypothetical, but if Donald Trump in the United States had taken a different approach to the pandemic, I think most people here in Washington, where I live, um, who are engaged in politics, believe he would have been reelected pretty easily, despite you know his dramatic failures and excesses, and you know uh, his his strange relationship with the truth. Um, but he was afraid of the pandemic rather than seeing it as an opportunity. In the book, um, we ha- there's a very bold leader who comes from you know uh, uh, the new economy and believes that rule old rules are inhibiting. He he wants to figure out what's the single most important thing you could do with climate change. He identifies what that is. And then he says, okay, we're going to fund this with classified budget. We're going to do it in secret because the political system won't support it. So we need to do this. I'm just going to do it with black budgets. And once it succeeds, everyone will be happy. So we'll let our success be our political leverage because he sees that the political system would not allow him to do it. And he would have to water this thing down. And he says, and climate change is a national security issue. It is putting everything at risk. It's putting our coastlines at risk. It's putting our bases at risk. It's putting our weaponry at risk, our satellites. So I'm just going to do this. And when I'm found out, which I will be, everyone will understand that it was a good idea and they'll actually support me for circumventing a political system that they know doesn't work. Okay. That's a form of leadership. It's very daring. His own, his own people in some cases, or at least his own vice president thinks this is kind of insane. And yet uh, toward the end of the book, she's persuaded that this program actually is too valuable to, despite its risks, it's actually the right thing to do. So yeah, I mean, I think you were in a situation where you need a leader. You, you don't need a technocrat. <laughs> you, you know, you almost need a, a leader who's ruthlessly democratic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this is your fourth novel. And from what you've learned about journalism and experience of fiction writing, what do you think fiction can achieve in terms of contributing to the wider narrative of you know, how who we are, how we move forward at, at a, quite a chaotic time. Yeah, I love that question because uh, I think about that a lot. I've written, you know, eleven different books. Seven of them were nonfiction books, and and four are novels. And I started writing novels when I, you know, at a, a later stage in life. You know, I've often uh, said that if at the, you know, if on election day the outcome is inexplicable. Then, then journalists have done a bad job um, because they haven't explained where the people are and how um, how the country could have arrived at the outcome or you know at, at the at the vote that they did. Assuming, by the way, that the vote is not rigged, <laughs> you know, the, the the votes are actually counted and all of that. Um, and and I think that to some extent is where journalism struggles right now. There's so many politicians that distrust the traditional press or what we consider the kind of reality-based press or are have decided to kind of just engorge themselves with with propagandistic partisan press that is not that interested in facts and is really not even journalistic they're they're really propaganda arms that journalism the media we get makes the world seem more confusing because the, the journalists themselves are befuddled by what's happening. A friend of mine who is a journalist said, you know, journalists always feel like that the future is is like the past or only more so because we derive our experience as journalists by having watched things before and knowing how they'll work and then saying, you know, this is what's going to happen. I, I know I'm the wise guy. I'm the wise, you know, real politique expert. So journalism is failing us in, in part because it can't understand these phenomena. Uh, it's bewildered by things like QAnon and, and, and all the rest. And one reason it does that it, is it struggles to get at the motivations of people, particularly in uh, the political motivations of people, which are often not rational. You know, people said, I, I hate government. Keep your hands off my Medicare, you know, because they don't know that it's a government health program. So you have this kind of irrational stuff going on. Fiction can get at the interior of life in a way that journalism can't. So journalism could tell me that the president said these words and there were seven people in the room and this was what happened. 
but it cannot actually do a very good job of saying, why did the president say that? It speculates, you know, amid declining polls, the president did that and the other thing, but you're not in the president's heart. In fact, you know, there's so many countervailing pressures that the existential crisis that a president faces every day is far more interesting than anything that's in the newspaper, which is much more focused on whether his numbers are going up or down. So fiction can get at that. It can get into the hearts of all of the characters in our political world and also get at why is it that all of these people could come to London or Glasgow or, or the, any capital in the world all of the people coming into politics actually want to make the world better. They're pretty idealistic with their own agendas. And the net result is kind of failure, widespread failure. How is that possible that all of these people could be coming with good intentions and the result is always unintended bad consequences? Not always, but often. Well, that's what fiction and particularly political fiction can get at because it can get deep into the souls and motivations. You know, you think of some of the great political literature of all time. Let's say, I mean, Macbeth is probably the seminal political, you know, thriller of all time. He's a good man. How is it that he ended up doing these things? That's the play. You know, all the king's men. Here's a man who had great idealism and populist charisma at the beginning of his career and ends up being a, a corrupt megalomaniac. Uh, by the end of the book. How could that happen? Um, much easier to do that in fiction. And it's interesting, even doing re research for fiction. As a reporter, when I would interview people about what happened and what did this guy say and what did the other guy say, and you're writing that stuff down. When I'm doing an interview as a novelist about the same event, I say, what were you thinking then? Had you ever had a moment in your life that was like that? What do you think he was thinking? at that moment, when you look, saw the look on his face, those are not things that they would tell a journalist because they wouldn't, they, you know, it's too interior. And it's not the things a journalist would ask because it's too squishy, but it's absolutely the things that a novelist asks because that's what you're trying to capture in the moment. The why of character is so much more important than the plot. The plot has to follow the character. It also, I think, to some extent explains why you know, the planet is warming. Everybody knows it. Even people who deny it actually know it. <laughs> they're afraid to do things about it because they're balancing different, you know, whether it's economic growth or jobs, they want to, they don't want to lose their job. Uh, it's always a trade-off for the immediate versus the far reaching. And, and then the climate deniers of the world have actually shifted their arguments in the last 10 years from uh, it's not happening to we shouldn't fix it, government shouldn't fix it. Because you can't actually deny the science anymore, but you can say that the solutions would be socialism and won't work. Yeah, we'll come back to that actually in a second. I just wanted to touch on you, know, you talking about climate and ecological issues. They're very much in the mainstream psyche now and in a lot of people, most people's experience of life in some way. Yeah. Um, how important is this particular theme to you and do you think you'll return to it in future novels? Yeah, um, I actually have been thinking about that. I could imagine a person who is not political, but whose life is affected by, by the changing environment, finding themselves beginning to engage in increasingly active or radical or even um, violent acts of protest. I don't have the story in my mind, but, you know, you have to, let's say you have to relocate your family from Latin America and you, you make the trek to the United States to try and find a job. Um, that's, you know, probably something you never contemplated. That's a, a radical act of self-preservation. That's interesting to contemplate what's going on in the mind of, of a person who decides to relocate his family and take all the risks of doing that because his farm or her farm in Guatemala is no longer, you know, arable land. And then imagine someone who, you know, works for an energy company and is kind of trapped in an environment where everything that they do is around extracting oil. And you could imagine a kind of an ensemble of characters 
increasingly facing and reacting in different ways. I could even imagine someone whose child gets radicalized and comes to a violent end, and that pulls the parent into being, you know, what happened to my kid who joined Greenpeace and then was murdered in, uh, you know, in, in Brazil or something by the government? That maybe is a trope that's a little bit familiar, but uh, parents and children is a kind of enduring uh, set of themes. Y yes. I mean, I think I've even imagined a story where someone at a platform company develops software where the algorithms in your sort of nest-like uh, thermostat start to control. They do it where you can control your house and really reduce energy use. The computer's doing it. And then the software just generally gets to the point where it says, the problem here is our human beings. And if we can reduce human intervention as much as possible, we could save the planet, but we, can, we need to actually <laughs> get rid of human beings. And like the, the, your nest, your nest thermostat is trying to figure out how to get rid of you. <laughs> of course, if it, was, if it was AI, then it would have a natural um, tendency to, to to target high emitters as well, which would be people people like me, <laughs> people in developed places. So yeah, it might be right. quite effective. <laughs> right. I, 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 that I need to do more research on, but I can, you know. <laughs> okay, and something to end on really. It, it does feel like a, a dangerous time. And I know we've, we've touched on a lot of these issues now. And do you think that there's a way that the writers and journalists, how we can, because I think we're all trying, we're all trying to steer a, a, a better path into the future. And yet we seem to be thwarted quite a lot. Do you see um, a sort of a way forward in terms of journalism, writing, and the, the contribution that can be made? Yeah. I do. I, I th And actually writing fiction about it has helped me think about that. Fiction in the end really is about people. I mean, you can write moral fiction and even political fiction, but it, it, that has to be character driven. You know, if it, if it reads like a uh, an editorial in a newspaper, you know, it, it can't just make an argument. You have to bring people to life and stories that are human. And I think the solution to a uh, climate is actually human. The more it's canted as uh, this will help Democrats or hurt Republicans or this will help conservatives, and the more it gets lost in the political battles that are about power. And then, you know, the issue becomes a subplot to a power struggle. So I think the stories about climate that we see in journalism that will be important will not be the policy stories. They will be the stories about a town and the people in a town and people in a coastline and people who, who are skeptical of climate change, who've changed their minds because of the realities that they face in their town, in their life, on their farm, in their coast, and who are not political people. They're people like me, if I were, you know, if I lived somewhere else and didn't care about politics. So when this becomes a story about people who are outside the political system and just want to live their lives... I think it will change minds. I hope that's not so late. You know, if you think about this in the arc of a story, in 1988, scientists first testified before Congress and said, here's what's going to happen. And they predicted things that are now happening right this year. At that point, you have to trust, you know, a handful of scientists who know things that most people don't know and are actually seem almost hard to believe. By the time the story, you know, by the time, think of a sort of a science fiction movie, by the time everybody in the world knows that, that something's happening and is really panicked about it, it's too late. So we're somewhere, we're at the beginning of the science fiction movie or, or but maybe before it. We're in that stage still where people's lives for the most part are pretty normal except for what they see on television. And they need to know people whose lives are being altered so that it becomes part of their life and not just something they see on TV. Sure. So more human stories. And also it comes back to these things that leadership really does matter. It's, it's kind of critical and the truth is critical. Okay. It's a good yeah. I mean, to... if you think about an issue like gay marriage, I mean, what happened was enough people were who were gay were, were, were now open about it. And essentially, almost everybody had a, someone who they loved who was gay. And that's what changed the political landscape quite rapidly, actually, on that issue, at least in the United States.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, thank you very much for talking to me. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, absolutely, Nick. Thanks so much for your, for your interest. I enjoyed it. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.